Today, let's begin talking about race among humans. What is race? A biological definition would put race as a subspecies. That is, a population of a species that differs in a set of allele frequencies from other populations of the same species. <clears throat> a race is frequently separated geographically from other races. Are there races of any mammals? Well, one example is the black bear, Ursus americanus, which has 16 subspecies or races. The gray wolf has four to five subspecies in North America alone. Let's look at some definitions of human groupings. <clears throat> Ethnicity refers to a group of people who share the cultural traditions of a particular homeland or hearth. Nationality is a group of people who share legal attachment to a particular country. Haplogroup is a genetic group of people who share a common ancestor on the patriline, usually followed through the Y chromosome, or the matriline, usually followed through mitochondrial DNA. Given the variation among humans, are human races a kind of subspecies? <clears throat> Are they biological groupings, that is, populations who share a gene pool that is different from other populations' gene pools? Do we see concordance in the traits shared by a human race and discordance between different human races? Isolating mechanisms that can lead to the separation of races or of species that prevent gene flow <clears throat> include geographical mechanisms, physical mechanisms, and social and cultural mechanisms. Different races do not inevitably evolve into new species, but note that if a race is biological, it would be a genetically isolated population that shares a unique gene pool or allele frequency. Early anthropologists tried to characterize the polytypic nature of humans by classifying them into races based on geographic location and phenotypic traits, frequently skin color. Early classification schemes <clears throat> dating as far back as 1790 attempted to classify humans into Caucasoid, Mongoloid, and Negroid. In the 19th century, researchers tried to introduce scientific method into the analysis of measures of human diversity. They used anthropometry, that is the measurement of human body parts and dimensions. One example of anthropometry is measuring the size and shape of the skull, and especially comparing width to length. Three of the length and widths noticed were dolichocephaloid, long and narrow, as you see on the left, ranging to brachycephalic, round-headed or short and broad, as you see on the right. Through time and in different places, Human races have been based on a number of factors, including skin color, national origin, religion, and social group. For example, we talk about the human race, the white race, the English race, the Jewish race. If you take part in a census, you are asked to define your race. And when you apply for college, you are asked your race. The U.S. Census Bureau collects race data based on self-identification these days, and people may choose to report more than one race. The Census Bureau says that people of any race may be of any ethnic origin. To quote from them, the racial categories included in the census questionnaire generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country and not an attempt to define race biologically, anthropologically, or genetically. In addition, it is recognized that the categories of the race item include racial and national origin or sociocultural groups. It's the U.S. Office of Management and Budget that prescribes and maintains the federal standards for data on race and ethnicity, and it's upon them that the Census Bureau relies for defining race. The Census Bureau requires five minimum categories, white, black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, plus some other category. 
Now they do have subdivisions within each of these, but by having some other category, they feel that everybody can write down which race they feel that they are. And you are allowed to mark more than one race. The idea of racial purity contributed to eugenics, which is a movement to encourage reproduction of favored individuals and discourage or eliminate undesirables. For example, Hitler tried to get rid of Jews and gypsies by killing them all. And through the 1970s, people in Sweden and Finland were sterilized, depending on people's ideas of who would be undesirable. So can humans be divided into races biologically, with sets of allele frequencies in one race that differ from the other human races? Well, what sets of traits could divide humans? And how many variations or characters must occur before one group is called a race, at least biologically speaking? And should there be concordance between a number of traits? That is, should a number of traits co-vary? And should any one race have exclusive possession of any particular allele? What patterns of human variation do we see? Today, we accept the clinal model, that genetically inherited traits usually change gradually in frequency from one geographic area to the next. This is the pattern we see in blood types, for example. And many traits of humans have continuous variation. So by calling a trait a characteristic of a race, we impose categories. We often see a clinal distribution, continuous geographic gradation. Skin color is one of these traits that here in America we frequently look at as an important racial identification trait. First, what influences skin color? Second, do other sets of alleles co-vary with skin color consistently? Well, skin color is influenced by hemoglobin, keratin, and melanin. Melanin is produced by specialized cells in the epidermis and all humans have approximately the same number of these specialized cells, but they vary in the amount of melanin produced and the size of the melanin granules. Melanin provides protection from harmful UV rays. The stronger the sun, the more need for this sort of protection. Populations with the greatest amount of pigmentation are found in the tropics, while lighter skin is found in more northern latitudes. Another factor seems to be the need for vitamin D. Vitamin D is produced partly by interaction with UV radiation, but also is available in some foods, and vitamin D is needed for normal bone growth. One result of not enough vitamin D is rickets, which leads to bowed legs and deformed pelvis and trouble giving childbirth. Lighter skin in more northern areas allows more production of vitamin D with the less strong sunlight found in those northern areas. In the late 19th century, dark-skinned people in northern U.S. cities had a high incidence of rickets, which led to us now fortifying milk with vitamin D. But traits such as blood type and skin color do not vary together. Again, variation in humans is clinal or gradual, and the distribution of blood types, for example, does not map on to the distribution of lactase deficiency or to skin color or to other sets of genes. Human variation does not break down into discrete biological races. The geographical distribution of any one trait seldom matches the distribution of any other. So depending on which trait you chose for racial division, it would be different if you had chosen a different trait. Rather, variation is clinal or gradual. The difference between individuals within a so-called racial population may be greater than the differences between populations. In other words, 94% of the variation in humans is within each race, and only 6% is between any so-called races. That, therefore, anthropologists state that there are no human biological races. 
So what do we mean when we use the word race in everyday language if we're not talking about a biological grouping? Well, race is a cultural grouping with no consistent boundaries. That is, the race that you are in this country may be a, an entirely different race in a different country. In American culture, one acquires his or her racial identity at birth by arbitrary social rules. Why do I call these arbitrary? Well, for example, the one drop rule places a person as black if they are known to have any black ancestor, no matter how remote and no matter their personal appearance. This is called hypodescent, which is the rule of descent that places a child of mixed ancestry into the minority group. But to be considered American Indian, you must meet a blood quantum. You must have at least one eighth Indian blood, an entirely opposite sort of social rule. So in America, to belong to one race, any amount of blood counts, but to belong to another race, you must have enough blood. In contrast, there are no sharply defined racial groupings in Brazil. People are assigned to racial groups based on what they look like, such as their skin color, hair type, and facial features, regardless of their ancestry. Additionally, social class and the manner of, that you dress and the amount of education that you have count also. So in Brazil, which race you belong to depends on how you look at the time. So if two siblings look different, they will be classified differently, even though they share the same parents. And as a result, the same individual may be called by different racial terms at different times in their life and by different people. In Brazil, it is suggested that racial discrimination is relatively mild whereas discrimination in terms of social class is sharp and pervasive. Racism is the belief that one race is superior to another. Ideas like this have been used by groups with social power to justify and preserve their privileged social positions. But such positions are not supported by biology. No one race is superior to another. Knowing your genotype or releasing information about it, or breeding people based on genotype or phenotype raises a lot of ethical issues. Cloning is making a, an exact genetic copy of an organism. Genetic enhancement refers to adding genes to produce desired traits. And we now have this capability, but should we use it on humans? Scientists can now move genes coding for a certain characteristic from one organism to another. Firefly genes have been spliced onto tobacco, such as you see here in this illustration. Flounder genes onto soybean. The Institute for Responsible Technology lists many of these crosses. So for example, spider genes have been inserted into goat DNA. Cow genes turned pig skins into cow hides. Jellyfish genes lit up pig noses in the dark. And Arctic fish genes have given tomatoes and strawberries tolerance to frost. And field trials have also included corn engineered with human genes, sugarcane with human genes, corn with jellyfish genes, tobacco with lettuce genes, rice with human genes, corn with hepatitis virus genes, potatoes that glowed in the dark when they needed watering, and human genes inserted into corn to produce spermicide. So what kind of genetic enhancements of, ha of humans would be ethical and which wouldn't? As you can imagine, there's a lively, long-standing debate on these kinds of issues. What if you could tell your embryo would be a dwarf? What if you wanted your child to be unusually tall so that she could excel at basketball? What if you wanted your child to have immunity to AIDS or Alzheimer's disease? These are very sticky issues. To summarize, race as a subspecies can have a biological basis. 
As such, it's a population of a species that differs in a set of allele frequencies from other populations of the same species. But there are no human biological races. We see more variation within any one race than between races. Human race is therefore purely a cultural construct, meaning the definition of any one race depends upon that society. Here are some terms I've used that you can quiz yourself on. What is racism? It's the belief that one race is superior to another. Clines. Variable expressions that grade into one another over geographical space. Anthropometry. The measurement of human body parts and dimensions. Eugenics. A movement to encourage reproduction of favored individuals and discourage undesirables.